today's episode is brought to you by Squarespace. With the help of Squarespace, tackling your next move might not be as difficult as it seems. Whether you're hoping to start a business, change careers, or launch a new creative project, Squarespace gives you the ability to create an online platform from which you can make your next big idea known to the world. And with Squarespace's award-winning templates, creating your website is a simple, intuitive process. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com and enter offer code capital M-E-G to get 10% off your first purchase. For 30 plus years, I've seen every type of child grow up. Instead of giving me what I wanted, she gave me what I needed, which was truth. Don't let emotions win. Let truth win. Do your very best, and you should have a lot of fun while you do it. And the better you get at something, the more fun you're going to have at something. You moms and dads are wired with everything you need to be a parent to a great kid. Welcome to Parenting Great Kids. This is episode number 25. It's going to be awesome. Raising Great Girls. I'm your host, Dr. Meg Meeker. I will be speaking today with Dr. Leonard Sachs, who is the author of Girls on the Edge, Boys Adrift, Gender Matters, and his most recent book has been a runaway bestseller, The Collapse of Parenting. This is the first of two episodes where I will be talking with Dr. Sachs. First, we're going to talk about girls. In our next episode, we're going to be talking about boys. Also in this episode, I'll be featuring listener questions from a mom concerned that her little girl is trying to grow up too quickly. As always, I'll share my points to ponder for you to start using right away. Parents, as a reminder, don't just listen to the episodes, click subscribe, because when you do that, you're joining my parenting revolution and Every new episode will automatically show up in your subscribe list. You won't regret it. And we'd love for you to write a review on iTunes and let us know what you think about these podcasts. Not only are we on iTunes, but the Parenting Great Kids podcast is also now available in the Google Play Store and on Stitcher. So no matter where you get your podcasts, subscribe today and don't miss one single episode. Many of you know that I have a passion about the relationship between children and fathers. There's so many good men out there trying to be good fathers, and they're not getting much help. Every child wants to know his father because he's born with an innate belief that you, his dad, are his hero. And who wants to be denied a hero, especially a personal one? Whatever your situation in life, the fact that you are a father doesn't change. And neither does the fact that your children need you. If you are married, divorced, widowed, or a stepfather, and you want what is best for your children, then I have something to share with you. My new book, Hero, Becoming the Strong Father Your Children Need, will release May 15th, and it is now available for pre-order at Hero Dad Book. In Hero, I share how and why you should strive to be a hero father and the impact your presence and involvement has on your children. When you pre-order Hero, you will also receive a bundle of free digital resources created especially for you. For more information on Hero and all the free bonus materials, just visit HeroDadBook.com. That's HeroDadBook.com and pre-order your copy today. So parents, thanks for listening. This is episode number 25. Stay with us. So now let's review my points to ponder. Number one, focus on your daughter's strength. Focus on her strengths. Reinforce the importance of being strong to your daughter. You know, many times we focus on the way our daughters look. We say, oh, you're so beautiful. Oh, you're so thin. Oh, you're so lovely. Um, Gee, you look beautiful in that dress. It's fine to say, gee, you look beautiful in that dress. But it's really important, particularly with daughters, not to focus on their looks very much. Focus on important things. I want to tell you something. Many girls, even down to third grade, I think a study said that 30% of third grade girls have considered going on a diet. Why? They want to be thin. Why do they want to be thin? Because other girls want to be thin. They come to believe very early on in life and 
early elementary school that being thin and waifish makes them important and significant. If they are thin, they are more likable. People will pay attention. Um, so this gets ingrained in a girl's thinking very early on in life. And I think a lot of dads don't realize this. I'm sure they don't realize this because you think very differently than young girls do. Um, but girls are very attentive to their looks early on in life. And they learn that being thin is what they're supposed to strive for. So reverse that. Talk to them about strength, the strength of their body. They want strong muscles. They want strong legs that are going to help them play basketball well. They're going to help them dance well. They're going to help them um, do what they're supposed to do in life very well. They need a strong body. They need a presence about them. Think about this. When girls learn that they're to be thin, they believe they're supposed to go away. They're supposed to literally sheer pounds away, sheer muscle away. They are to be wayfish. And what they come away with is believing they're to be weak. They're to be less, not more. Literally, they believe they're to be less of a presence, have less person standing in front of other people than more person because more means fat, less means thin. And that translates into less is weak. So weak is good. Even if I'm just physically weak, that's that's what I'm to strive for as a young girl. Dads, you don't want your daughters believing that. Moms, you need to teach their girls they're to have a presence. They're to be strong, not just strong physically, just strong in character. That they need to be very assertive people. They don't need to be obnoxious people. They need to take themselves seriously, but they need to be very strong. They need to be strong emotionally. They're not there to hide their feelings or to wear their feelings on their sleeves, but they are to grow up to be women that can endure life. They can deal with hardship. They can deal with tough relationships and not cave. They can um, assert themselves with boys and that this is a good thing. It doesn't make them a, a mean person or an undesirable girlfriend or wife. They are to be strong emotionally. They're to let their feelings be known, their voice be heard. They are to take their intellect seriously, their grades seriously. And this is one of the great things that's been happening. We've seen in the education trend is that girls are getting more high school diplomas. Girls are going to college in higher numbers. They are going on to graduate schools. They are taking their intellectual growth very seriously. And this is wonderful. So we want to encourage our young girls to do that, that they don't have to live with fear. They're to be physically strong. They're to be mentally strong. They're to be emotionally strong. And they're to be intellectually strong. So this is the message that we need to communicate to your daughters. Dads do it and moms do it. Focus on strength of everything. Second, don't focus only on their appearance. Your young girls live in a world that is grotesquely obsessed with appearance. Social media is about pictures. It's not about words. It's about pictures. Instagram is more uh, popular for girls than Facebook is because they want pictures. They want snippets. They want to see what their friends are doing. And their friends want to see that they are happy, that they, the friends, are happy. So a child posts a picture on Instagram that shows them in their best light. Here's my cool outfit. Here's what I look like. Here's um, how beautiful I am. Here's how happy I am. Here's how great my life is. Everything is in a snapshot. It's an appearance, It's but, it, but it's not reality. And when we only talk about a girl's appearance, oh, you look so pretty. Don't wear that. Your hair looks bad. Your hair looks beautiful. Um, we're feeding into that. We're feeding into that sense that the superficial and the superficial is alone is the most important aspect of who you are. So what we talk about to our kids, what we say to our kids, um, the remarks we make, the themes that we make with our remarks are what our kids believe is important to us. So what we talk about, the topics we talk to our kids about is a communication of what we believe is important in our kids' eyes. So be very, very careful. Don't just focus on your daughter's appearance. Third, teach her what the cultural messages coming at her are and how they're working against her. And by doing that, you can combat them. 
For instance, you can look at the cover of a magazine, Vanity Fair, whatever. Uh, I have no problem saying trades, Cosmo, and say, what do you think of that cover? What do you think that cover is trying to commit? What is that girl trying to say to you about herself? And don't go on your rant. Don't lecture her. Ask her what she thinks. Because let me tell you a trick about kids. If you ask the right questions and they give the answers that are in alignment with your beliefs, the answers stick because the child believes they came up with that idea. So you ask a lot of questions to to move your child in the direction your, your questions have an intention about them. You are moving your child to give the answers that are in alignment with your beliefs. And then the child learns that those are his or her beliefs. So if you see a, a movie, if you see an advertisement, if you see a cover of a magazine, don't do it in a snarky, preachy, teachy way. Just ask an open-ended question. What do you think about what that lady is wearing? Why do you think she's wearing that? What do you think about the way she's standing? Why do you think they put so many sex scenes in these movies? Do you like them? Do you not like them? Are they good? Are they bad? It's hard. I know it's hard because you want to just drill down on your um, on your soapbox and say, this is terrible for you. And this is why they're over sexualizing you because they want to um, get you to pay for their products. But you don't want to launch into that diatribe with a third grader, of course, because you've lost them on the second word. Ask questions to teach your daughters about the messages that are coming at her. And what you want to get her to understand and see is, and conclude on her own is, the messages coming at me, 10-year-old girl, 15-year-old girl, are all about sex. These messages are coming at me to try to sexualize me, to get me to buy into the belief that being sexy and acting sexy and looking sexy gives me value and that my friends are going to like me more. If you sexed somebody a picture of yourself, you're going to get a lot of instant likes by guys, right? And that's going to make her feel good about herself, feel valued because she now has 2000 likes. You need to combat that with your daughter at home every day, day in and day out by asking her questions about the messages coming at her. Why do you think it is that Ellie got so many likes when she sent that picture out that showed her chest? With her just in a bra or a bathing suit. Do you want that for you? Do you want people to like you just because you're showing more skin? Is that who you want to be? And I know these are broader, deeper, more existential questions, but I'm telling you, friends, kids can handle it. Kids want to know what gives their life meaning and they want to have those conversations with you but they don't know how to start them so use this as an opportunity with your daughters talk to her about the cultural messages coming at her and what gives her significance what she wants to give her significance and what she doesn't want to give her significance. Really, really important discussions to have with your kids. You're the one to help her combat that. Basically, what you're doing, if you want to use psychological terms, is you're teaching her cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive thinking. What are the thoughts coming in her mind? The images. Behavioral. How is she responding to them? And changing the thoughts that come in her mind by the behaviors that she's doing. I don't like that this thought that I have to be sexy is coming into my mind. I'm going to change my behaviors, i.e. I'm not going to Instagram friends a picture of me without my top on, and that will make me feel better. Cognitive behavioral therapy. Very, very, very simple lessons. And that's what you're doing when you're asking her questions about the messages coming at her. I want you now to listen in on a wonderful conversation that I had with Dr. Leonard Sachs, one of the smartest people I know about raising girls. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Dr. Sachs, I really appreciate you doing this. I wanted to pull you on because I wanted to pick your brain. We're going to do a whole show about boys and a whole show about girls. And I thought you're the one who has to speak about this. If it's okay, we'll launch into girls first. Okay. Great. Dr. Sex, in your book, Girls on the Edge, which I love the title, you talk about four factors that girls struggle with today. You talk about sexual identity, cyber bubble, eating obsessions, and environmental toxins. Let's first tackle sexual identity. What confusion do you find girls experience today regarding their sexual identity? Well, I start that part of the book by talking about the sexualization of 
girlhood, Mm -hmm. that our American culture today pushes girls to present themselves sexually at an earlier age than was ever true uh, before. I, you know, in my own practice, uh, a mom was telling me how she uh, had a, a daughter, I think her daughter was nine years old, and um, mom had this wonderful costume that she'd actually held on to since she was a little girl of a uh, of a Bavarian Dirndl, a, a traditional German uh, costume. And her daughter said, no, uh, I've already chosen my costume. And she wants to uh, dress in this uh, very provocative, sexy cheerleader costume with uh, hot pants, uh, uh pantyhose and uh, high heels mm. and she's nine years old and and mom was saying all right well how about if you dress up as a as a grape you know a bunch of grapes and <laughs> and her daughter says mom only the fat girls do that uh, all oh. the cool girls are going as the yeah. sexy cheerleader or the french maid you know if you imagine and the funny thing is is that walmart has a whole wall of these yeah. costumes for seven, eight, nine-year-old girls. I mean, imagine going into a Sears 20 or 30 years ago and saying, um, you know, I'd like to get my daughter a Halloween costume that has a brassiere top, a hot pants. Uh, and high and, heels. Uh, a fishnet pantyhose and high heels. They'd probably call the police on right. you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because that would have been regarded as a perversion uh, 25 years ago to dress up an eight-year-old mm-hmm. uh, in such a way. But now it is standard American culture. Right. And it's not just Halloween. It is pervasive. I have parents who tell me, you know, I just wanted to get a pair of play pants for my daughter. Just, you know, comfortable trousers. And... They didn't have it at Target. They didn't have it at Kohl's. They didn't have it at Kmart. They didn't have it at Walmart. I had to go to the boys' part and get – and yet it, it, the girls' section, everything is skin tight. Right. Uh, and this sexualization of girlhood is harmful because it is pushing girls to present themselves sexually before its time. Right. And the result of pushing girls to present themselves sexually before their time is that they get – Unhinged, they get detached from their sexual identity. Everything becomes a performance. Mm-hmm. Uh, and two girls are at a party and they kiss each other and the boys hoot and holler. And so the girls do it again. Yeah. Uh, and you have girls who are presenting as lesbian and they haven't really, yeah. they're, they're 13 years old. I mean, uh, the, it's not health, healthy to push kids to do things before it's time. Yeah. I quote a line from the book of Proverbs, which is repeated three times in the book of Proverbs. The female narrator says, I charge you, I command you, daughters of Jerusalem, do not awaken love before it's time. Mm. Well, what does that mean? Uh, well, clearly she understands it's possible to awaken love before it's time because she's commanding the women not to. Mm-hmm. And what she's saying is if you do, If you awaken love before it's time, bad things are going to happen. And we are now seeing those bad things. We're seeing a whole generation of young women growing up who regard sex as something that girls provide to boys, that women provide to men. And in in the book I talk about, I I was uh, speaking uh, uh, down in Savannah, Georgia, and a uh, gynecologist uh, and a professor of gynecology at the Medical College, Georgia, um, told me how she is seeing so many young women now uh, who say, you know, I've I've never experienced an orgasm. Is there something wrong with me? Something wrong down below? And she does all the things a gynecologist would do, uh, ultrasound and all. And in every case, she told me, the woman's totally normal. Yeah. She said, the problem is the men. Yeah. They have no idea how to interact mm-hmm. with a woman. They've come to regard uh, women as aids to masturbation, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and the irony of this permissive era in which we push girls and boys to be sexual before their time is that they have no idea right. how to do it. Right. Rushing things doesn't make it better. It makes it worse. So they really lose out on healthy sexual intimacy when they're older And, you know, I think about the development of a healthy sexual identity, and I think that, you know, one of the things, you know, parents tend to forget, and even physicians, too, and and particularly progressives in our culture, is that the sexual identity is complicated, and it takes time to develop. 
you know, we're fed this, well, if you have feelings for this person or that person, that defines who you are sexually. Well, it's not true because your sexual identity is very complex and it takes years to develop. It's not a simple issue. And so really what you're saying is when we sexualize girls at a very young age, and I think this happens with boys too, but a little bit differently, we really rob them of that healthy sexual identity, the the development. We rob them of the development of their healthy sexual identity. But what you're saying too is we rob them of a healthy sex life later on in life because because it's just mechanical. And that's what's so ironic is that so many of these people who are pushing this uh, have no understanding of the long-term consequences. Yes. And there's a reason why most cultures in most times and most places have not allowed uh, 10-year-olds or 12-year-olds to present themselves sexually because it's not healthy. Right. Uh, it's not just old-fashioned. It's not healthy. Yeah. And uh, again, I think you and I are trying to get the word out that, yeah. look, when your 10-year-old is choosing a costume for Halloween, do not allow her to dress up as the sexy cheerleader. This has to be the parent's job because it's, uh, again, a lot of parents feel like, well, you know, a lot of the other girls are doing this and I don't want her to feel left out. Look, a lot of the other girls are going to end up anxious and depressed if they're typical American teenagers. Yes. You don't want that for your daughter. If you want your daughter to be confident of who she is, then you're going to have to do things maybe a little different from some of your neighbors. Absolutely. And and it's really a parent's charge to protect the growth of their daughter's sexual identity and not just throw it away and say, well, that's what the other girls are doing. How does the early sexualization of girls affect their sense of worth as they grow through their teen years and into their 20s? Well, this is where we get into this perfect storm. Uh, And I talk about different factors. And we've talked about one factor, the sexualization of girlhood. But then we've got this whole other factor, which is social media. Mm -hmm. And I visit schools. I talk to middle school kids and even younger kids. And I say, who here is on Instagram? All the hands go up, almost all the hands. Who's on Snapchat? Among 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds, they're all on Snapchat. And the girls are figuring out that, hey, if you want to get a 1,000 followers on Instagram, you just post a few pictures of yourself in a bikini Mm -hmm. in a provocative pose at age 12, and you will have 2,000 followers overnight. Now, what the girl doesn't understand is that a lot of those followers are men and a particularly creepy variety of men that you really don't want following you, but they don't know because these girls are intensely competitive. And if Emily's got 1,000 followers on her Instagram, then I want to have 2,000 followers. So that makes them feel puffed up. It makes them feel good. They feel like I'm popular. Um, people like me because I have a lot of numbers. But so that's a that's a great point. Let's talk about that and dive into social media and the cyber bubble. Um, you and I know because uh, we see things behind closed doors. So we really know what messages these girls are getting across their phone screens. And, you know, sexting is a big deal, too. You know, as I tell young people and teenagers, you know, boys particularly, if you are sexting or receiving um, a text from a girl who's 14 or 15 in a sexual position or whatever, that can be a very serious legal issue down the road because you could be participating in child porn. Um, but many Many parents are frightened of the the electronic devices they put in their kids' hands, but they put the, put them in their kids' hands anyway. So, what can parents do to help their ten, twelve year old daughters sort of navigate this? Because they feel once I give it to her, I'm not in charge anymore. So, what do you tell parents of young girls <laughs> to do? Absolutely. I've got a whole spiel prepared that I because I, I give this uh, little sermon to parents very often. First of all, no 10-year-old, no 12-year-old should have a smartphone, period, no exceptions. Uh, and parents will say, yeah, but my daughter's doing these activities after school. And, you know, if her ride doesn't show up, she's got to have a way of contacting me. I say, okay, I get that. I'm the father of a daughter. But that's not an argument for a smartphone. Right. That's an argument for a dumb phone. You can <laughs> give phone. your daughter 
one of these basic phones. There's lots of them out there. They're marketed mostly to the elderly, and they can make a phone call, and they can receive a phone call. And they've yeah. got big numbers and a simple display. That's fine. That takes care of the safety issue. She does not need a phone that can take a photo and send a photo, and you shouldn't allow that. Now, for your a teenager, you've got a couple options. One is to say, I'm sorry, you're not going to have a phone. And you know what? You can do that. And I know parents who have done that. And the other girls are fine with it. They'll say, oh, you know her. She's the one with the weird parents who won't let her have a phone. But the the mom who first told me this in, in um, uh, just outside Salt Lake City, Utah, she said, um, it was the other parents, the other moms especially, who were getting on her case and saying, right. how can you do this? You're shortchanging your daughter. Right. And this mom told me she feels that the other parents are insecure with their decision. And so they're attacking her. So one option is don't give your teenager a smartphone. But if you're going to give your teenager a smartphone, you must put some software on it like Net Nanny Mobile so that anytime she takes a photo, that photo goes immediately to your phone and to your laptop and she knows it and you tell her look if I see any inappropriate photo you lose the device indefinitely right. this gives her an excuse uh, and you got to give her an excuse because that's a culture in which she lives we now have all these studies showing that something on the order of 40 percent 50 percent of American teenage girls now are sending provocative photos not necessarily obscene photos but provocative photos and so these two girls are uh, one girl says, hey, I'll take some pictures of you taking your clothes off. You take some pictures of me taking my clothes off. We'll send them to our boyfriends. And this was my own patient that this happened to. And she said, well, I can't do that because my mom's installed Net Nanny. Uh, actually, it was My Mobile Watchdog is the name of the program. My Mobile Watchdog on my smartphone. Every photo I take goes immediately to my mom's phone. Here, try it out. And uh, so the other girl took a picture, and then they called mom at work and said, hey, Mr. Kirkpatrick, uh, we just took a photo. Did you see it? And mom was looking, yeah, uh, let's see, uh, flowers in a vase, gardenias. And the girl who had proposed the strip tease said, wow, she said, I wish my parents cared about me that right. much. And the strip tease did not happen. So I said another study in which researchers interviewed American kids who actually are engaged in sexting. They're sending and receiving obscene photos. And they ask girls and boys, why are you doing this? And the most common the answer the boys give is because they really like to. Uh, the boy really enjoys taking a photo of his own erect penis and sending it to a 14-year-old girl. Mm. And the 15-year-old boy believes that the 14-year-old girl is going to be excited and aroused mm. to receive this photo. He doesn't know that many 14-year-old girls will be disgusted yes. to get a photograph of a boy's erect penis on their phone. He doesn't know that because he's only a boy. But then they ask the girls, why are you doing this? And the most common answer the girls give is some variation on, well, I wish I didn't have to because right. I really don't enjoy it. And then the researcher says, what do you mean have to? You don't have to do this. And the girls say, well, at this school, it's what all the cool girls do. Right. That's the culture in which your child is living. You have to give your daughter an excuse to say no. Allow her to say, hey, my parents have installed this software on my device. If I take a photo or receive a photo like that, I'm going to lose my phone. You know, you're so right on. And I think that parents really underestimate how much pressure their kids feel to jump in the, into this um, activity and behavior because they feel they really need to do that if they're going to be popular, accepted, cool. and But they, but underneath, they don't want to do it because they are disgusted. They do feel creepy. You know, that reminds me of another study where they showed that 40% of girls 14 to 18 have sexual activity that they don't want to participate in. And when they're asked why, most of them said because they didn't want to hurt their boyfriend's feelings. So mm -hmm. girls need a way out. They need a way out. And I'll tell you, once a group of 10 girls finds one or two girls who have a way out, they want to be like those girls too. And and I parented very much this way too. And I am fortunate enough to be at a point where my kids are now adults who look back and say, mom, thank you so much. My son was given a smartphone by a family member when he was in high school. And I said, you know, honey, we've talked about about this now, now he's in 11th grade and I said we've talked about this and you know you can't have an iPhone until you're out of high school and some parents go how can you parent that way 
And so we made him take it back and we hurt the other family members' feelings. But you know, my son is now turning 25 and he said, Mom, thank you for doing that. He's still young and yet he realizes very quickly that as geeky as he thought I was at that time and his dad, it doesn't take them long to realize that you really had their back. And so kids who don't feel protected in the um, cyber arena and feel protected by their parents to avoid all this sexual nonsense don't feel loved and protected. So I want to encourage all the parents listening out there, please, please, please be the geek for your kid because your kid will feel really loved. Parents, I hope you're enjoying this conversation I had with Dr. Leonard Sachs. We need to take a quick break right now, but don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. As the year progresses, it's easy for some of those New Year's resolutions to fall to the wayside. But if you've resolved to take on a new challenge like starting a business, changing careers, or launching a creative project, achieving your goals might be easier than you think with Squarespace. Squarespace is used by a wide range of people and businesses, including musicians, designers, artists, and restaurants, and gives you the ability to create an online platform from which you can easily make your next move into a reality. With Squarespace's award-winning templates, creating your website is a simple, intuitive process. You can add and arrange your content and features with a click of a mouse, and there's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. Though, if you do have a question, Squarespace provides award-winning 24-7 customer support and can help you with any problem, no matter how technical or trivial seeming. So whether you need a landing page, a beautiful gallery, a professional blog, or an online store, tackle your next move with Squarespace. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com and enter offer code capital M-E-G to get 10% off your first purchase, plus a free domain. That's capital M-E-G for 10% off off your first purchase. Squarespace, make your next move, make your next website. As parents, we often worry about how to pass on our faith and values to our children. How can we help them understand what faith is? What does following Jesus even look like? Well, I've discovered a terrific new book series called The Adventures of the Sea Kids. And these books can really help you teach your kids faith and values and even explain abstract concepts in a way they can really understand. The Adventures of the Sea Kids is an award-winning children's book series with vivid, Disney-esque illustrations that show young readers what a relationship with Jesus looks like in tangible, relatable ways. Whether it's the story of Fast Freddy teaching kids about courage and strength, or the story of a servant like Jesus, which teaches children the importance of helping others, each of the stories in the six-book series give children fun and entertaining examples of how to pursue a genuine faith in their day-to-day lives. I'm especially excited to share with you the newest book in the Adventures of the Sea Kids series, releasing just in time for Easter, called God's Easter Miracles. It's available for pre-order now at glmpublishing.net, along with the other books in the series. And if you order now, you get 25% off. Just use the code MeekerMD. That's glmpublishing.net and the code MeekerMD, and you'll get 25% off. Let's jump on to obsessions. You talk about girls who struggle with obsessions. Um, they, They become obsessed with their weight. They become obsessed with pleasing people, with this whole sexual identity thing. Why do girls in particular struggle getting obsessed with fads and particularly, you know, dieting? That's a big one. Well, I think all of us as human beings need a sense of who am I? What am I about? What gives me a sense of worth. The way American culture is working right now, for girls, it's become all about surface. It's how cute you are, how many followers you have on Instagram, whether kids like your picture on Snapchat. And so girls are latching on to something that gives them a feeling of self-worth. And for one girl, it's academic achievement. And so mm-hmm. she defines herself as a straight-A student, and that's who I am, and, and that's what makes me different and important and worthy. And for another girl, it's athletics. And uh, for another girl, it's being cute and getting you know 10,000 followers on Instagram. And sometimes parents can get confused and they'll be like, well, I'm very proud of my daughter. She's very academic and she's not at all concerned about uh, Instagram. Uh, But 
you need to understand, yeah, it's great for her to be academic, but has it gone over the edge? What's driving this? Mm -hmm. And if it's just this desire to be better than others, to impress other people, if it's all about the performance, that's not healthy. If your girl loves physics because she's astonished by the symmetry and beauty of the laws of nature, that's great. But if she's obsessed with taking AP physics because she wants to impress colleges, because she wants to impress other people, if it's about the performance, that's not so great. Mm -hmm. You need to know your child. Uh, and, and the reason it's not so great is because it creates fragility. If this girl defines herself as the best student, as a straight-A student, then one B on a report card is a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. And this girl is crying and suicidal because, and I've seen this, the, and the parents are baffled. It's like, so what? It's B. But for her, it's existential. Her whole sense of self has crumbled because she's no longer the top student. She's no longer the straight A student. She doesn't know who she is. Mm -hmm. And also in Girls on the Edge, I talk about a girl who was this incredible soccer player and scouts were coming from around the country. And then she planted her foot wrong, got a complete rupture of the ACL, couldn't play and plunged into this profound depression mm -hmm. because she was no longer the great soccer player, in which case, who was she? She had right. no idea. It had all been about the performance. And when the performance was over, she had no sense of who she was as a human being. Dr. Sachs, I'm going to call the parents on the carpet here, too. And I know this is tough love, but we need to do it because parents feed into this. I talked to a number of parents who are obsessed with their kids' performance. And in particular on the West Coast and the East Coast. And, you know, they feel that it is their job to create a great portfolio for their child so they can go to the right college, get the right job, and so on and so forth. And sometimes, you know, parents can be worse about this than their kids. So how can parents avoid that trap? Because we're right in it with our daughters. Well, I think you need to break out of that rut and don't listen to what other parents are saying and spend time with your daughter. Go for a walk in the woods. And uh, again, we as parents, we can get caught up in this. And I had a parent say to me, look, you know, my daughter has a real shot at an athletic scholarship and that would really be a big help. And I understand that. I respect that. But you need to focus on the most important thing. And the most important thing is your child's character, your child's sense of self. What college they go to is not the most important thing. Being a kind person, a good person, a person who's comfortable in their own skin, that is the most important thing. And instead of waking up early to go to soccer practice or staying up late to try and get an A instead of a B in physics, sometimes... It's more important to spend time with family and uh, connect with one another. I'm all in favor of hard work, but you need to be mindful of the boundaries and of guiding your child to a healthy balance. You know, Dr. Sachs, you just, your last book, The Collapse of Parenting, has done really well. It's an outstanding book, and I encourage every listener to read it. Do parents spend enough time with their kids these days? Well, American parents are spending more time with their kids than American parents did 30 years ago. And this is especially true of dads. And we have good data on this point. But the problem is, I think that it's often the wrong kind of time. If you're spending time with your child, uh, chauffeuring them from soccer practice to dance practice and not having a meal at home, that's not the greatest time. The unspoken message of that kind of frantic running around is that it's all about the performance. Mm -hmm. It's all about building the impressive resume. Resume. It's all about being on the soccer team and the dance team and this activity and that activity. And instead, you want to break away from that. Don't let yourself get sucked into that 21st century American, we're all so busy kind of franticness. Mm -hmm. Instead, say, you know what, let's drop an activity so we can spend more time at home together, no screens. Do you think parents feel that as they look around and they look at how their friends are parenting and they see all their friends running their kids to all these activities, do you think that they feel that if I don't do that with my child, then I'm not as good of a parent? I don't know that parents would say that out loud. Mm -hmm. But how do we know what to do as parents? Well, we think back to the way our own parents did things, but 
we were growing up in an era without social media, without some of this hyper-competitive sense that people have about getting into colleges. I remember I applied to only one college, which in retrospect is insane. Uh, you know, what if I hadn't <laughs> well, gotten in? Yeah, and you want uh, do you want to tell our listeners what that uh, college was? It was MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, <laughs> yeah. which is a pretty selective college. Yeah. But it was the only college I applied to. And, you know, my mom was busy. She was a working mom. She's a full-time pediatrician. And she had three kids. And what was I thinking? But, yeah, what were you, you know, thinking? Now, now it's common for kids to apply 12, 15, 18 yeah. colleges. So how do we know what to do as parents? Well, if, if our own childhood doesn't give a good guide, we look at what the other parents are doing. And I say to parents, don't do that. Because American parents are doing it wrong. American kids are much more likely to be anxious, to be depressed, to be diagnosed with ADD, to be uh, on medications like Risperdal, Zyprexa, Seroquel, compared to kids in other countries by factors of 10, 20, 90 times more likely to be on medications compared to other countries in some cases. And this wasn't true 30 years ago. American parenting has gone in the wrong direction. It's become all about the performance. So if you want your child to be healthy, to be happy, not to be on medication, not to be diagnosed with one of these disorders, you're going to have to do things differently. Don't look at what other parents are doing. Listen to your heart. Take time off to be with your child. That's a perfect place to end. Absolutely, because I was going to ask you for a couple nuggets to leave parents with, but you're so right, Dr. Sex. And I thank you so much for um, being with me and talking about girls because parents need to hear this message because girls are so precious and there's so much out there that's trying to take them down. And good parents need to listen to their heart and just dial life down a little bit. Well, thank you so much. It's great talking to you. Thank you. Likewise. All right, parents, let's get social. I want to hear from you and I want to interact with you. You can connect with me anytime on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Meg Meeker MD. Or if you have a question, send it to me, please. Ask Meg at MegMeekerMD.com. Today, I have a question from Kristen. Dear Dr. Meg, my eight-year-old daughter is starting to want to grow up ahead of her time and wants a bikini and a training bra. She's very strong-willed, and once she sets her mind to something, she gets very stubborn, especially once I say no. The bikini and training bra thing hasn't gotten there yet, but I can see it getting there. I need a game plan. Should the decision to wear a bikini be hers at a certain age down the road? Do I need to teach my eight-year-old to respect her body? It was a National Geographic article about how men view women in bikinis that firmed up my decision to not want my daughter to wear one, but how do I teach that to my daughter? Also, should she be allowed to get a training bra before she needs one? I'm hoping that's still a couple of years away. Well, Kristen, that's a wonderful question, and I could give you a very simple answer. So I'm going to give you the simple answer, and then I'm going to tell you why. Should the decision to wear a bikini be hers at a certain age down the road? Answer, no, because you are smarter even when she's 16. You know how boys are going to look at her. She won't know. All she's going to know is she gets a lot of attention that she likes, but you know she gets a lot of attention that isn't very good, and you don't want her to have that kind of attention. She can make decisions about a whole lot of other things. How do you teach her about how to respect her body? Very easily. You respect it. Now, regarding the question, should she be allowed to get a training bra before she needs one? I think you know the answer to that, and the answer is no. And my answer to you is stick to your guns. Trust your gut. You know the answer to these questions, and you're writing to me to tell you, go with your gut. Unfortunately, you and I are living in a world where a lot of parents don't trust their gut. We feel pressure to act against our instincts because we doubt ourselves. Don't doubt yourself, doubt your friends. Don't doubt your instincts, doubt their parenting styles and their parenting instincts, okay? But you have to live with your conscience. You know it's right for your daughter. 
Let me tell you what is going on. Many eight-year-old girls, and we're talking second graders here, some are in first grade, but but we're talking about a second grade girl who should be playing hopscotch and jumping rope and, um, and playing jacks. And that should be her world and it should be fun and she should be even playing Candyland. We have girls who are now paying attention to their sexuality. Listen, an eight-year-old girl has no idea what her sexuality means, and she doesn't know what it's about, but she's living in a world that is trying to shape and influence her sexuality. You must protect her from that because she doesn't have a clue what it means and what it's about. So you don't allow something into her world prematurely. You must let her be eight and you must keep her eight. Keep that other stuff at bay. You are her lion at the gate, if you will. You are the moat around her. You are to keep her eight. And then when she's nine, you keep her world as a nine-year-old's world. And if that to you means no bikinis and training bras, it's no bikinis and training bras. And let me tell you, Kristen, your instincts are dead on. And I will tell you, most parents have the same instincts you do, but they don't have the courage to act on them. And we need to be strong parents and quit being such incredibly wimpy parents. Because when we're wimpy parents, guess what happens? We raise daughters who live by Instagram, whose feelings go up and down and whose self-esteem goes up and down according to the number of likes that they get on their Instagram or their um, Facebook page or whatever else is going to be out there in the next couple of years. That is not okay. Strong parents are needed to raise kids who understand the meaning of their life and their own worth and they understand why they're put on this earth. That's what we want, parents, in our girls. We want to raise girls who understand that they don't have to live with fear, that their value is given to them by God. It has nothing to do with what they put on their bodies or how many likes they get on Instagram. But in order to get there, they can't have a wimpy parent. So Kristen, you need to be a very strong parent. Your daughter shouldn't wear a training bra until she really needs a training bra. And when she really needs a training bra, she probably really won't want a bra because by then it'll only be a bra. Once she wears a bra, it's it's not going to mean anything to her. But she shouldn't wear a bikini. Why? Because you need to teach your daughter modesty. Do you teach her modesty and to cover up the beautiful parts of her body because she's ashamed? Absolutely not. You teach her because you appreciate and you respect her body and you're teaching her to appreciate and respect her breasts and her genital area. And the reason you're teaching her that is because those are the very special places of her body. I often do something with kids who are in my practice or eight years old. When I uh, go to examine them and I take a bra or their underwear off, I cover them up. And I say to them, why am I covering you up with this piece of paper? And they go, I, I don't know. And is it because I, cause I know you're going to be embarrassed? No. I cover you up because... These are the places that are very special and private, and only the doctor or mom or dad should see these places, not because you're ashamed, but because they're so special. And I even use the ridiculous illustration, but it works with kids who knew Michael Jackson. Do you remember when Michael Jackson wore a white glove on one of his hands? What did that do? It made you intrigued about the hand that had the glove on it. It made you want to see. It it gave you mystery. He wasn't ashamed of that hand. He was covering it because he wanted to be very, very special. We cover our bodies because they're special, not because we're ashamed. And I, as your parent... And the one who has to make the rules about what goes on your body within limits, you know, and my teaching to my own kids, and it worked really pretty well, was no skin in my daughters from neck to knees. No skin from neck to knees. Um, you know, arms didn't count. They could show their arms, but their midriff and their breast area um, and their pubic area had to be covered up and their shorts couldn't be too short. But when they went to school, no skin from neck to knees. And it worked really, really well. And I would tell you, my kids have grown now and have um, come to thank me for that because they appreciate and respect their bodies very much. You need to teach your daughter to that. She has no idea. 
and she will still have no idea when she's 16 years old how boys look at her. So it's very, very important. No training bra, no bikini. And as a matter of fact, and I tell this uh, at many of my conferences, I speak uh, with Dave Ramsey. I say this. If you have a father in the home, dad should be in charge of a daughter's wardrobe. A dad should look at the clothes she's wearing and he should approve them before she goes to school. That makes moms crazy. And I get it. It makes mom crazy. But listen to dad. It's very important. Parents, I love answering your questions. I hope you can tell that. I have the best job in the whole wide world. I get to talk to you about your kids because I know that you are the ones who are shaping your kids, not me. I'm here to hold your hand and help you and stand behind you and put my hand up against your back and help you stand up. But I have the best job in the whole wide world, and that is to encourage you on how to encourage your kids because you have the power in your kids' lives, nobody else. I want you to keep sending me your questions. You can email me your parenting questions to askmeg at megmeekermd.com. Again, email me your questions, askmeg at megmeekermd.com. I'd like to thank my amazing guest and friend, Dr. Leonard Sachs. Let's recap my points to ponder. One, focus on teaching your daughter to be strong. Two, don't remark on her appearance. Remark on things that are important. And three, Teach your daughter how to recognize toxic messages that are coming at her in our culture and reversing those messages. So until next time, parents, remember, great kids are raised, not born. Hey, this is Bobby, producer of Meg Meeker's Parenting Great Kids podcast. We hope you've enjoyed listening to episode 25, Raising Great Girls. And thanks to you, Dr. Meg's parenting revolution has grown to over a half a million downloads. You can like Dr. Meeker on Facebook and follow her on Twitter and Instagram at Meg Meeker MD. Just as a reminder, go to MegMeekerMD.com and sign up for her newsletter for giveaway opportunities and updates. And don't forget to share the podcast, write us a review, and click subscribe so you won't miss an episode.